That was fun. Oh, good. That was fun. I mean, the, the singing wasn't very good, but the <laughs> other guys. <laughs> I'm <thinking> a bit <laughs> rough. <laughs> well, th- this is you singing rough. Yeah. Listen, uh, let me out you on this because I, 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 don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but you, yeah, when you first walked in here, you said you're a little hungover. But that, that I said the first time. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I mean, right today. Oh, today, yeah. Yeah. You don't, I mean, people who are hungover. Yeah. Don't traditionally sing that way. You've fig- <laughs> you've clearly figured this out. <laughs> well, I'm not that experienced at it. I just um I thought um things have been going really well, so I thought I'd have a few glasses of red last night. I haven't had a drink since New Year's Eve. So Really? Yeah. And you used last night as an opportunity. Yeah, I knowing know. Knowing you were coming in here. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, you... I had a bad flight, so I I, I drank dr- got started drinking on the flight. On the flight. Yeah. Do you uh um you know, do you actually now that this is a big career for you? have to think about preservation of your voice in ways that you never did before. Yeah, absolutely. I had laryngitis at the beginning of January, about 10 days just before my album came out in the UK and Europe. And um, it was really frightening. My voice, it, it literally was like a faucet, like, like a tap. It just stopped coming out during a radio show in France. And um, That's I've, never been been, terrifying. I, I've never been so shaken in my life. So um, I've given up smoking. It's been like five weeks and six days Congratulations, now. Congratulations. No yeah. spicy foods, no vinegar, no citrus. No spicy foods? No, yeah. Um, I've got a steam every day, twice a day um, for my throat. And about, about, no drinking, no fizzy drinks. So you have rituals. You, yeah. you're, you're fully in Yeah, the... it's a schedule. It's regimented. And wh- wh- you steam, meaning you just put your head over a boiling uh, bowl of water yeah, or something? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. To, and to lubricate my throat. I see. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's yeah. what she says. That's yeah. what my crazy voice therapist says. Well, absolutely. But, but well, this is you know because and what about talking during the day? Celine Dion famously, yeah. you know, doesn't talk or didn't. I don't know if she does now. Didn't talk on a show day at all. Yeah. You know, to preserve her voice. Yeah, that'll be pretty much happening on my tour. Yeah, I have to be quiet for at least two hours a day. Wow. Well, I guess so because you don't just sing. You sing. I mean, you <laughs> you sing out when you sing. You yeah. you're you're kind of given it, but. You don't feel that, you know, that that feels natural to you. What you just did there. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Your voice doesn't feel strained, right? No, 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 not at all. I mean, I, you know, um, it, wasn't as, it wasn't as easy as it normally is. But Did yeah, you have to learn to sing properly? Did somebody, after you became, started to become well-known and, and sell all these records, yeah. did, a, did a vocal coach go, okay, now you're going to let me show you how to do this right? Or did you always kind of sing from your body, you know where it was coming from? Yeah, I've always, um, I think I've always like kind of sung from my diaphragm. I've never ever sung from my throat and stuff like that. Um, but no, I never had any coaching or any lessons before, and I still don't. I do warm up now. I never used to warm up um, so I, I've got my kind of little thing before. Right. Just to protect it, you know, because it's like, you know, for years, you know, you do whatever you want. And then when, you know, it's, you don't think you're going to have to use your voice as much as you do. Because you don't think you're going to be get signed and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? So you've right. got to look after your voice now because I do a lot Do you have stuff. a voodoo remedy if something goes wrong? No, just hot water and honey. It's just here. That's okay. Yeah. That's old and I school. Go, I go silent and I have a chalkboard and I write on that. <laughs> it's pretty old school. Really? <laughs> yeah. So you have a chalkboard with you on tour in case something happens? <laughs> no, I use a notepad, but at home, my poor mother. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right. Well, no. I try my best. I've got to look after it. It was so frightening. Well, yeah, it's it your really it's frightening. your gig. Yeah. yeah but even just the thought of, even if I you know, wasn't a, a, like didn't do singing every day, just the thought of not singing in the shower makes me sad. Mm. Just not being able to sing. It's right. Horrible. But but if your voice hurts, then you can't sing in the shower. You have to write things on the chalkboard to yourself. <laughs> yeah, then totally. the chalkboard gets washed off with the water. It's a disaster. <laughs> I spoke with you on the phone uh, a number of months ago when we premiered that song, Rolling in the Deep, here, a North American premiere here on Q. Uh, and back then you described how you'd matured and become, I'm quoting you, less stubborn and less bitter. Yes. Since your last record, uh, I mean, musically you can you can hear the growth. Uh, tell me about personally, because the last time you were actually in here, you were exhausted. Yeah. I mean, you had been touring nonstop. I felt I almost felt bad that we brought you in here <laughs> to, for an interview. You looked just like, always and, fun. And in you here. said, "I can't wait to get home, mm-hmm. you know, and just be at home, be with my mom, and and hang out." Uh, how are you feeling personally now? I'm fine. I'm really good. Um, yeah, I mean, I had a lot of time to to recoup and stuff like that, and um, no, I'm I'm in a good place. I'm happy. How do you feel like you've grown personally? I just feel like I've you know I've, I've kind of um, been exposed to a lot more. Um, I've had two extra years, um, <laughs> and I've just seen. I used to be like I used to not really care about learning about things. Like you know, I was a stubborn teenager, and I used to think that everything I knew was everything I always needed to know. And you know, I was. Um, not not in a horrible way, it was just, you know, I guess I was quite lazy, whereas now I'm like, I want to be a bit of a sponge and soak everything up. And yeah, like, like what? What do you want to learn now? Like, 
wine and, and food and agriculture and like politics and traveling i hate flying but you know i like to travel right. <laughs> um all sorts of things like agriculture yeah. just everything i just right. want to like try and know it's like about you know before it was literally boys and music right <laughs> that was my life up until about a year and a half ago <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> and you feel like you've learned enough now. Yeah, the, you know, my, my, with, the, with the boys. Yeah, my, but well, my last boyfriend, he was older than me. He'd seen more of the world than anyone I'd ever dated before and stuff like that, you know, and he opened my eyes to a lot of things. He's, is this the, the boyfriend that the record is about? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you haven't shied away from talking about uh, how this, thematically, this album charts the end of the relationship and your your quest for vengeance and, <laughs> and, and self-assuredness. Tell me about the experience of, of uh, making that the crux of this record. It was quite hard. It really hurt. Um, but I had to do it. You know, I've always written songs or, or written my emotions down since I was really little. Um, so it had to be done. And I felt like I was going on a real journey with myself when I was writing this record. The first record, I just, just wrote it. Do you know what I mean? It was, it, was, it was about my first boyfriend, the first album. But it was just, uh, there was nothing kind of, I don't know, I just did it. Whereas on this one, I had to do it. I felt like I, I couldn't breathe mm. unless I unless I wrote you know wrote the songs on. Will this each future album be about a boyfriend? Well, I, I hope hopefully not. <laughs> well, there might be a positive record. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't think I'd be very good to, when I'm happy. <laughs> I ain't writing songs about being happy. Not as good. You're you fall in that camp. Not as good when you're as a writer when you're happy. I don't think so. I've got I've got one happy song on this album, which is I'll be waiting, which is actually quite a dark happy song because it's actually admitting that I'm an idiot and all this <laughs> stuff and how many flaws and disappointments I have. But um. Yeah, I uh, hope, hopefully one day I'll be able to write about positive. Things. You don't mention the guy's name, but did you? Did you have any concern about outing yourself so publicly in terms of your personal affairs, or was that? Did you think twice about that as you were I did writing and the recording beginning. songs? Yeah, at the beginnings when um, when like not the kind of commitments and promo for nineteen were winding down. Um, and there's some, not many, but there's some like tabloid, trashy, you know, magazine journalists who like would really try and dig deep in questions and try and mm. find people and all that kind of stuff. So I was like, oh, that's it. I'm never writing about myself again. But, you know, I, I have to believe myself to want to like part with my songs and let people hear them. Do you know what I mean? Because the artists that I like, I believe every single word they sing. So I've got to make sure I believe myself. Otherwise, I'm doomed. Right. Um. So, I, you know, it was... Um, it was once I thought of it, of it like that, it just it happened quite quickly. What about immortalizing one feeling that you have about it? Because, I mean, in retrospect, your former relationships, you sort of change your opinion about the, the person over time, yeah. right? Uh, at first, you might be angry. Then you sort of go through a period yeah. of indifference. And then maybe you become friends. Yeah. You've described yourself as bitchy about him yeah. uh, on this record. <laughs> so what So uh, what happens if that changes? I mean, do you feel bad if, if you're friends with him now? Oh, well, no, we're not friends. You know, oh, what, so, you, <laughs> so you don't feel bad? Just, no, I don't you know. feel bad. So, I mean, when, when I, don't you remember was the very last song we were talking, I know you like that one. I love that we song. Was, that was the very last song I wrote. You wrote that, yeah. Uh, on this for this record, yeah. I was in. I wrote it when I was in California, and it got to the point where I was so exhausted from being so bitchy about him and, and like being angry and being bitter and and stuff like that that. I was, you know, I started reminiscing, you know, and um, I couldn't remember why I loved him. And then I started, but I did start remembering like how if he didn't text me back within a minute, I'd totally freak out. Like, and how I, my whole body would shiver when he just touched me and say hello, you know, and it, I find it quite devastating how, you know, you can just fall out of love with someone, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I did go on that journey and it, that, that comes out in songs like Don't You Remember and someone like you, I'm at total ease with it. After I wrote that one, I was on my hands and knees crying for feeling, you know, finally freed. Mm. So and then and what does the song then a song like Don't You Remember because it is my my fave uh, which you refuse to play for me here I haven't refused <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding but does a song like that um, or even Rolling in the Deep I mean do you think about the subject matter when you're singing or does it become a song that you own Yeah yeah, it just, yeah it just it, happens. then it's music then yeah. yeah. Uh, let me talk about. Let me ask you about the musical direction uh, you take on this record. One of the producers on Twenty One is Rick Rubin. Yes. Uh, um, he's the acclaimed American producer, known largely for his work in uh, hip hop, hard rock, country. He, he's produced Johnny Cash, Beastie Boys, mm. Tom Petty. Tell me about how you hooked up with him. Um, I met him um, when I did SNL, actually, which was like obviously a night and a moment in my career that completely changed my life. Um, and he was there, and I saw. I was during Chasing Pavements, and I remember when I watched back SNL like quite recently and um 
I could see in my eyes when I spotted Rick Rubin. He's behind the camera and he was doing his like infamous bulb, you know. And um, he has an infamous bulb. Yeah, like oh. the way yeah the way his body moves when he's listening to music is quite amazing. <laughs> and um, yeah, I anyway, I shit myself because uh, <laughs> I'm a huge huge fan. And I met him backstage and he was lovely, really really nice. And then we kind of bumped into each other like completely unplanned mm. a couple of times. And then at the Grammys in 2009 was when. Um, we both mutually kind of decided to do the record together. I didn't ask him because it's a bit egotistical in it to ask Rick Rubin, hey, do you want to do my record, Rick? Well, <laughs> not when you're Adele. <laughs> oh, I mean, no, Two shut. Grammys and... No way. Anyway, we uh, just, it just sort of happened. and um, He it, asked you. Yeah. He said to you, uh, if I've got the story right, yeah, he, he said to you, let's do, can, the let's do a record together. Yeah. <laughs> and he came to my Hollywood Bowl show and I remember he he, he said he wanted, he wanted to portray my live show on record, you know, because hmm. um, he thinks they're very different and stuff like that. Um, he was pretty amazing though, like just like how authentic it is and like it's all about the song. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes that's quite easy to forget sometimes with the kind of start, like the ever changing styles that are popular and you know, in terms of the charts and all that, which is very much a part of my life. That's the kind of music I like, but to like be reminded that it's all about the song and all about the music and how a song moves you. It was very important. That how hands on was he? Well, this is the thing. I started like hacking myself, thinking, "Oh my god, I'm working with a producer who's never going to come and stuff like that." From what people said and stuff like what that. What do you mean, never going to come? He, he, he people doesn't... like he never comes to the studio. He comes in, and <laughs> says yes or no, and then leaves. I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god!" But he right. was—I'd arrive and he'd be there, and I'd leave and he'd be there. Right. He was very involved, you know, very. And what did he tell? What's something he told you that will stick with you? Do you remember uh, something that you learned? You are talking about learning things from I think Rick it was Rubin? all about the song. You know, it's like you have to you have to decide on a song about how it makes you feel. Mm. You know, how it moves you. What about this move into? I, I mentioned off the top that there, there's there's more eclectic sounds, and including sort of a country sound at times on this record. Yeah. Um, more boldly pop at times. There's a blues sound. Um, what was it? What, tell me about exploring the countryside, for example. That was um, when I was on tour here. Um, some of my crew, my driver, and my tour manager, and some of the bands and stuff like that. And then fans started doing it. Um, started making me compilations and mixtapes or suggesting artists and stuff like that. Just because I knew nothing about it, you know, because it's not, it's not, the only country I know is like a crossover tune like Shania Twain or Leanne Rhymes or Dolly's 9 to 5 or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Because right. it's not part of my culture and it, or right. my, mine and my family's culture anyway in the UK. And um, so I was fascinated by it and I loved it. And um, it just sort of, um, I, I, I felt really moved by it, you know, and that was that thing that Rick told me and it was how instant it was. And there's so many songs these days that I do like that after nine and a half minutes, I'm like, what the hell is this song about? Do you know what I mean? And with country, it's just so instant. Immediately first chord or a note or something and you just know it, you know, and I love the storytelling and I can be in any situation, put my headphones on and be taken off into a fantasy world, right. which is what I like about music. By who? Like what's a country artist that you really like now? I love Alison Krauss. Oh, yeah. I think she's amazing. And I discovered her just before everyone started doing the compilations when, when the Raising Sand record came out with Robert That's Tyler right. and T-Bone Burnett. And Actually, I was, when I was speaking to you... Was I going on about it? You were in no, no, you were in, in November. You were... Where were you? Were backstage? I was at, at Jules Holland with, with Robert Jules Plant. Holland, and you saw Robert yeah. Plant. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He, he was like standing near you yeah, or something yeah, at the time. Yeah. Who's since been here, and, and what a great guy oh, he's he amazing. is. Yeah. yeah. So I fell in love with her uh, through that, and um, the T Bone Burnett, some of the bluegrass stuff. Love Garth Brooks, Garth Brooks rather, Loretta Lynn, uh, the Carter family. Love Johnny Cash. I've always known a Johnny Cash, you know, um, and June Carter is one of my idols. I love her. Um, but lots of stuff. And then, you know, more modern country as well, like Lady Antebellum and stuff like that. And Dolly Parton's early stuff, she's so dark. Like, her early stuff is super dark, do you know what I mean? Um, oh, she's, but lots of stuff. She, she's yeah. a great writer, too. Yeah, she right? is. She wrote I Will Always Love You and Jolene in one afternoon. I love it when I hear her talk about that. It, not in the same afternoon. The same afternoon. Really? The same afternoon. <laughs> I, are you really? I, I never I've knew heard, that. No, yeah, I've heard her talk about it. The same afternoon. She, I will always wow. love you and Jolene. Just in one sitting, you know, yeah. just knock it out. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good afternoon. Yeah, yeah totally. I'll, I'll have some of what she's having. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's, that's remarkable. Do you feel a responsibility? You have a really avid fan base, you know, and, and, and all around the world now and here in Canada and North America. Um, not that this, you've changed the sound of your, uh, your, as an artist very much here. Uh, you haven't got a 360 or something, but, uh, or a 180, what would be a different sound? 180, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, 360 would be back to this yeah. sound. Um, but, but do you feel, do you think of the fans when you're writing songs and do you think of, uh, an Adele sound? No, not when I'm writing the songs. Um, it's very personal when I'm writing my songs. I mean, and I, there were a few times I was kept kind of 
wondering if maybe I should be thinking, is this song, you know, radio friendly, you know, or like, is this going to, you know, have the same impact on people's lives that my first album did? Sometimes I felt bad that I didn't feel about, feel, you know, wasn't asking myself those questions in the studio. Um, but, you know, my songs, it's, you know, I'm oblivious when I'm writing my when mm. I'm when I'm writing music, right. um, and you know, it, it, people ask me, you know, because there's like the sophomore slump thing that everyone keeps talking about here, and um, <laughs> and uh, and well, it doesn't seem to be much of a slump. <laughs> but, but they keep saying it, and I just right. you know, if I thought about all those things, I don't think uh, that I think my I would my record would sound over overthought and stuff like that, you know. Um, so I don't I don't I'm uh, no pressures or nothing. I was oblivious to it. I heard you wrote, "Don't you remember Rolling in the Deep?" And I will always love you in one afternoon. And I will always love you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you wrote all of those in one afternoon? I wrote Rolling in the Deep and He Won't Go in one afternoon, in one sitting. You see? Yeah. You've got yeah, a, but they're not the, quite Jolene and I will always love I you. I don't know. <laughs> Can I ask you a personal question? I, I, yeah. I, you, you've got a really glamorous looking wedding ring on your Oh, wedding. I've worn them on that finger for a long time. They're just very pretty. You didn't get wet and married or something. No, I'm single. <laughs> right. But it's very nice. Thanks. What is, what, what's, you just like it and you put it there. Yeah. Well, you don't want to talk about that. <laughs> well, it's... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a great pleasure to have you here Thanks again. Thanks so much for having uh, why, me. We again. get really excited when you're going to come back here, and 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 I have to say, we just mentioned that you're going to come on, and people start freaking out oh. because you really have a devoted and and wondrously excited uh, a fan base, and and it keeps growing. Um, so you're going to play another song for us. Yes. What are you going to play for it can us be now? Someone like you. Oh, all right. Yes. Head on over there. Thank you so much.